Muzzy for that uh, talk. I think I learned quite a bit. Um, so I've been given the task to talk to you about clavicle and elbow trauma. Uh, so it's a bit of a broad topic. Um, and given the elbow is the best joint in the body, there's loads to talk about. So I'll just get started and we'll see how time goes on and I'll um, stop if necessary. Um, so feel free to post any questions you like uh, and then the modulators can um, just jump in and ask me the questions. So we'll keep it as informal as possible. Um, so as uh, Mr. Jason has said, I'm a consultant at Bart's Health. So uh, part of my job is working at the Royal London where we see loads of crazy um, upper limb trauma. And so uh, if you ever get an opportunity to come and work there, it's great. You'll get more exposure in six months working there than you will do in most places in the southeast. Right, so uh, just a quick disclaimer, I'm not that bright and most of the stuff I'm presenting you today um, I've taken from somewhere else, so no original thought whatsoever. Um, lots of the images uh, I'm using are courtesy of Lee Van Rensburg, who was one of my fellowship bosses up in Addenbrooke. Uh, so thanks to him also. So the first thing we're going to do is tackle the clavicle. And I'm going to put up a few x-rays. Uh, and given there's quite a few people on the um, on the Zoom, I won't ask people to shout out. But have a think about what you would do for this. And then what you would do is it right? for this one. We'll just rattle through them. Number three. Number four. So more of a mid shaft fracture. And another mid shaft, shaft fracture, number five. So just keep in mind what you're going to do. I'll uh, try and um, teach you a bit and then see if you change your opinion. Um, so the first thing to say is that the clavicle is divided into three bits. The medial side, i.e. Uh, the sternum side, the middle section, and the lateral side. Now, traditionally, these are the numbers that are banded around. That 80% of fractures are in the middle third of the clavicle, and only 5 to 6% on the medial side. But actually, there's some work that uh, I helped out of in Cambridge, which we actually showed that there's a lot more medial-sided fractures. It's just hard, harder to diagnose them. And because it's tiger territory behind it, people are a little bit in denial about the injuries. So it's probably, as I said, a little bit more medial than um, we think. Now, I'm going to try and not bore you too much with stuff you can read on ortho bullets, but I'm going to show you some important papers that you can think about when um, when seeing patients. So I gather there's the majority of people on the on the call are SHO or EB um, doctors. Now, the, a massive chunk of the patient's impression about whether or not they want to have an operation is going to be determined by you. So if you go in there as an F2 first day of orthopedics and say, oh, that clavicle fracture was horrible, you definitely need to have an operation. And then they come up and see me, who's a fellowship trained surgeon, and tell them you don't. They're going to value your opinion more because you were the first person who told them that. So it's important that you guys understand the literature before um, telling the patients what they what they should or shouldn't have. Um, so this is a good paper that came out of the UK, which looked at um, operative versus non-operative for mid shaft over the majority majority of uh, fractures. And I've just taken out a couple of extracts. So um, basically, what the paper told us is that the non-union rates are a little bit better if you operate on people and put in a plate and screws, probably in the order of 10 to 15 percent. The other thing that we know is that time for union is quicker for patients who have surgery. So the big selling point for having a clavicle fix is if somebody wants to prevent a non-union as much as possible and if they need to get to work as quickly as possible. Other than that, you can leave any clavicle fracture alone unless it's open. This next slide um, is from a different paper which shows which types of clavicle fractures went on to unite and which didn't. And you can see it, it kind of breaks it up into displaced, comminuted, displaced and comminuted, or not displaced, non comminuted. Um, and you can see that if there's displacement and comminution, the rates of non union are highest. Um, men have a higher risk generally, um, sorry, women have a higher risk of non union than men, generally speaking, and the older you get, the higher the rate. Um, but the kind of take home from this is that the more combination and the more displacement probably means the higher the energy that goes through the fracture site. And as you probably will learn from your AO course, a fracture is not just a bony injury, but it's a bony injury associated with a big soft tissue injury or the soft tissue injury associated with a bony problem. Um, so have, you know, uh, interrogate your x-rays properly and think about 
how displaced and how convoluted and how much energy has gone through them. So the other thing that people often talk about is if you're really short on digital functional outcome change. So this is uh, another big paper that was coming out of Edinburgh, which looked at lots of patients, 105, and lots of words there, but I've highlighted the bit that's important in red. So no significant difference in clavicular shortening between satisfied and unsatisfied patients. So what this will tell you, or what the interpretation from this, is if it heals in a short position, it shouldn't really matter. Now, I won't bore you too much uh, longer with mid shaft clavicle fractures because we've got a lot to cover, but what this what these studies often don't go into detail about is when your clavicle shortens, your scapula starts retracting forward, and that changes the whole kinematics of your shoulder girdle. So for most people in society, all they need now is to have their hands in front of them. Rarely do we need to lift our hands. We're not hunter-gatherers anymore. Not that many people you know, work as electricians, builders, and so on as they used to. Um, so the vast majority of people have a shortened clavicle fracture, a bit of scapula dyskinesia, but never notice. Um, so again, if you have those patients who have those jobs, um, then have a low threshold or lower threshold for offering them surgery. Um, so those are the really take-home messages for mid-shaft fractures. The rest of the you can get from ortho bullets. The next one I'm going to tackle is lateral fractures. Oops, sorry. Now, Rockwood, so it was another crazy uh, American surgeon. This guy used to work in Austin. Um, uh, and he came up with the Rockwood classification of lateral clavicle fractures. And they were basically based around the coracoclavicular ligaments, the ligaments that go between the lateral end of the clavicle and the coracoid, of which there are two, the trapezoid and the conoid. And so he came up with all these different types. And I don't really like this classification system because it, you know, normally you'd think that, oh, someone's drawing on screen, that a type five is worse than a type one, but there is some ambiguity between your twos and threes and fours. Essentially, for me, a lateral clavicle fracture is bad when the coracoclavicular ligaments are still attached to the lateral fragment, i.e. this bit of bone here. If you have a look at this fracture, a 2B compared to a 3 or a 4, the medial fragment, i.e. the rest of the clavicle, is actually floating. It doesn't have much of an attachment. So that has a higher rate of non-union than a fracture where the coracoclavicular ligaments are still attached to that because this is a nice stable clavicle, so this will go on to unite. So in other words, things like a 2A, 2B, or a 4, uh, or a 5 for that matter, are at risk of a non-union, whereas a 1 and a 3 probably isn't. So that, should make, for me, should be your decision about whether to offer surgery, what the coracoclavicular ligaments are attached to. So back to our x-rays. So this was patient number one. And I'll just show you what we did and what happened. So uh, we left them alone, didn't do anything, and it didn't unite. And probably the reason being, the ligaments are still attached here. Uh, and so that medial clavicle is free floating and didn't heal. So whoops. Um, this one, similar situation. So we fixed it. And what this is, a little anchor that goes into the coracoid that brings, that will repairs the ligaments back down. And they did fine. Um, this is another one, uh, similar picture, coracoclavicular ligaments attached there. Um, it somehow managed to find its way back down and healed up. So it's not always uh, the case that what you think is going to happen is going to happen. Now looking at a mid-shaft fracture, this is shortened, displaced. So we fixed it. Patient did really well. But this is a very similar fracture on the other side. We left it alone, and lo and behold, it healed up without any problems. So take home message is think about the patient, think about what they do, and then particularly with the lateral clavicle fractures, think about the anatomy. Um, I'm going to leave it there for clavicles because um, for me, those are the kind of bits you need to remember. And as I said, the rest you can just get online. Um, the only other paper I'd like to draw your attention to is um, is this one. So this is a, so Pete Brownson is a big surgeon up in Liverpool and he was uh, president of Best not so long ago. Uh, and so this is one of the really interesting studies which came out of there that basically looked at the different points on the clavicle and talked about the trajectory of your screws. So as I said at the beginning, medial clavicle fractures are tiger territory, right? You're really worried about putting a, um, a drill in because you, if it comes out the back and pisses one of those vessels, it's going to be bad news for the patient. Um, so uh, when, it, when you do come to start to fix these, 
have a look at this paper and it really will help you in deciding the trajectory of your scrutiny. Now, moving, so Muzzy has kindly done the uh, proximal humus for us. So next we're gonna move to the elbow. Um, has anyone posted any questions? I'm afraid I can't see. Not yet, so. Excellent, so I'm either answering everything or really boring. Um, so now this is uh, a talk I've prepared before and so it's got loads of slides in it. So I'm just gonna kind of go through it systematically. Um, and then if it begins to drag on and we want to give up, um, just tell me. And then I'm happy to do another session at some point. Um, but looking at the elbow, we've got to think of lots of different types of injury. So we can have a distal cumal fracture. We can have a proximal radius fracture, a proximal ulnar fracture. We can have injuries to the ligament, a combination, an explosion in the elbow joint. Um, so there's loads of different injury patterns. It's not just a broken bone or, you know, just the proximal humeral fracture. Sorry, Muzzy. Um, uh, and so it's a difficult joint to understand. And um, in terms of kind of all the big joints in the body, I think we're way behind in the elbow in terms of really knowing how to fix things and get things going compared to other joints, um, which is why I find it the most interesting. So how do we injure the elbow? Uh, there are kind of three main ways. First is falling onto an outstretched hand or axial loading. Um, the second one is rotation or torsion. And the uh, and the final is a varus or valgus stress. Um, or often in big high energy injuries, you know, like we see at the London, a combination. Um, so I'll try and tackle each of the individual bits one by one. So the first thing we'll talk about is proximal radius fractures. Um, so forgive the wordy slide, but uh, I just wanted to give you some important snippets um, which uh, I wish I knew during training. But so the first thing is the radial head articulates not only with a capitellum, but also the lesser sigmoid notch. So it's articulates with the ulna. And so when you're looking at your x-rays, don't just concentrate on whether the radial head lines up with the capitellum, because you'd be surprised how deceiving an x-ray can be. Also looks at whether or not there is a normal articulation with the ulna. Um, high loads go through the proximal radius. So four times your body weight during isometric exercises. So it takes a huge amount of stresses. And as a result of that, it's a very important secondary stabilizer from valgus stress, particularly when you have an MCL incompetent elbow. Um, it's normally injured with a fall onto an outstretched hand or with a slightly flexed elbow. However, 40% of them are associated with complex elbow injuries and the mischief, the badness that happens in radial head fractures when people underappreciate the severity of the injury and they think it's just the radial head fracture. Um, so again, more snippets about seeing the patients in A&E. Uh, look for swelling, crepitus, and bruising because that's what clinically will give away those bad injuries, the soft tissue injuries. Um, it's important to examine the range of movement of an elbow. So your radial head or your radial capitella joint is responsible for forearm rotation. So if somebody's got normal flexion extension, you'll be deceived that the radial radio capital joint is case. So make sure you're examining the right thing. Um, now, because of the high energy injuries, you might well have a proximal radial fracture and an injury to the interosseous ligament that goes between the radius on the ulna, and then therefore an injury to the distal radial ulna joint. So be sure to examine that and if necessary, x-ray it. Now, a lot of people talk about aspirating um, the hematoma and injecting local anesthetic, particularly to see if there's a mechanical block. But to be perfectly honest with you, in my experience, it doesn't work very well at all. Um, mainly probably because by the time you get around to doing so, the blood's just turned to kind of a, a thick hematoma and you can't really get much out. Um, however, if you want to do it, it's dead easy. Lateral epicondyle, radial head and electronon, there's a little soft spot just in between the three and that's where you shove your needle. Um, so same principle if you're aspirating a joint for query infection. Now, classification. So I'll tell you the classification systems that you use and that you're going to describe in the x-ray meeting. But for me, these are the things that you need to know. Number one, how bad is the fracture? Number two, is it simple or complex? I.e., is it associated with a more of a significant injury? And um, finally, are there any other injuries associated with it? I.e., distal femoral fracture, um, you know, any other upper limb injuries? So the classification system that everyone uses is the Mason one. And uh, we're going back what, you know, almost three quarters of a century now. Um, one, two, three, simple. One is an underspaced fracture. Two is a marginal rim fracture or, or like partially displaced. And three is multifragmentary. 
Now, the problem with this is it doesn't really tell you what you need to do with it unless it's a type one. So Hodgkiss in 1970, he's one of these godfathers of elbow surgery, came up with basically the same classification system, but adapted it to make it a little bit more relevant to us. So one is an undisplaced or minimally displaced. Two is broken, but you can fix it. And three is broken, but you can't fix it, i.e. you need to replace it. And that's a bit easier to kind of then use to decide what you're going to do. Um, probably the biggest elbow unit, apart from Bart's Health, obviously, in the world is the Mayer Group. Um, so they came up with uh, a kind of um, an extended Mason classification. Again, forgive the words. Um, but essentially what they did is use the Mason classification system, but then added like a suffix at the end. So if associated with a coronary fracture, it gets a C. So it kind of be like a 2C. Um, similarly, the lecronon, ligament injury, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a really comprehensive way of saying how bad it is and whether it's associated with anything else. Now, this is an x-ray I came across uh, in clinic once. And this is a really nice x-ray because it demonstrates the importance of the radial head. So if you look at this top x-ray, and I assume you guys can see my cursor if you can't, someone holler. Um, it looks like a fairly innocuous, not too bad injury. You know, you'd say, is it a Mason 1 or 2? Um, but what I don't think was quite appreciated was the fact that at the time of injury, there was an elbow dislocation. So if you look closely at the glenoid, at the, glen at the on a humeral joint, it's not it's not reduced, right? So this is a bad injury. This patient must have had a quite significant force going through their elbow. And I'll tell you what, I would not like this to be my elbow. So some smart ass decided for some reason to excise the radial head. Um, now, I don't know where it happened because uh, the, the documentation's incomplete. So I wonder whether it happened somewhere else in another country, but these x-rays were pretty much a year apart. Bad injury, patient comes back in pain with a malreduced fracture must have had an excision of the radial head somewhere. And then a year later, they've gone, this is a 30 year old, by the way, they've gone from that to a completely trashed elbow joint. So don't be fooled by what looks like not too bad a radial head injury. Now, how do we fix them or how do we treat them? Lots of options. One, just treat them simply in a collar and cuff. If you're going to do that, the collar and cuff is just for the first few days after that, you've got to get them moving because otherwise they stiffen up. Uh, number two is to fix it, and there are two camps. One is to use headless screws, the other camp is to use plates. I sit firmly in the headless screw uh, camp because I think once you start going down the neck and violating the annual ligament and so on, uh, it just causes more problems. Next step is to use a radial head replacement, and we're using more and more as time goes on. This is horrible. I don't like anyone excising radial heads. I think you're going to have a really good reason not to either fix or replace. And finally, the role of arthroscopy. So one thing that sometimes happens is you get kind of what looks like not too bad a fracture, but you get a, a bit of cartilage that flips up and literally causes a mechanical block. So not bad an injury, but they get, normally it's loss of supination that gets to about here and they can't go any further. And in those patients, if you don't want to fix anything, what you can do is you can pop a camera and have a look around, you know, flip out the cartilage again, and then you can sometimes even percutaneously fix um, the radial head with screws. Uh, unfortunately, we probably don't see enough of these to be able to get really good at doing them, um, but it is an option. Now, just, you know, again, for those who are beginning to go on uh, and fix them, um, David Ring, who was the, the prof of hand surgery in Boston and now has moved down to Austin, he um, he wrote quite a bit about fixing radial head. One of the things he talks about is if you've got three pieces of the radial head that have basically fallen out of the joint, you can take them to the table, reconstruct them, piece them all back together with wires and screws, and then literally put them back in the elbow um, and fix them. Um, but he also goes on to talk about the fact that you shouldn't put radial heads back in, that you can't mobilize and load straight away. So if you're concerned about the fixation, you should just replace it. Now, another study, which I thought is probably worth mentioning is um, is one that came out of state. Now, benefit of over there is all the insurance data is actually quite easily accessible. So you can really interrogate it and find out some interesting things. So there's 58 and a half thousand fractures of which five or so percent were treated surgically. And you can see the breakdown. Over half were fixed, quite a few arthroplasties, and thankfully only 5% were upside. Now, if you compare the, that distribution with the different types of injury patterns, you can see some for just an isolated fracture, the majority were fixed. Very few were resected, thankfully, um, but not that many were replaced. So then as you get down to kind of super bad injuries, so 
dislocation, coronoid fracture, and olecranon fracture, you're dealing with a much, much worse beast, bad English, but you know, a completely different entity. And you can see as a result, more and more fractures were replaced. And that's the kind of pattern I'd expect to see, apart from this green bit disappearing. Um, the final take home thing of fixing and replacing, and I know probably this is a little bit advanced for a lot of you, but it's worth bearing in mind that of fractures which have been fixed, that you're more likely to need secondary surgery than you are if you go straight for radio head replacement. So replacing is a good option, reduce the risk of um, fractures falling apart and soft tissue injuries causing problems, and you also reduce the risk of secondary operations. Moving on, radial neck fractures. I'm not going to spend any time on here because normally it's in teeth. I think I've only ever seen a couple of adults with purely radial neck fractures. Very rare, simple classification system. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that and tell you that it doesn't often happen in the adult. So that was the proximal radius. And we're doing all right for time. So I'm going to move on to the proximal ulna. So this is probably what you see the most of in the elbow, right? So your electron fractures. Um, so much like the radius, the first thing you need to do when you see someone with a proximal uh, uh, ulna or an electron fracture is to distinguish between the simple ones and the complex ones. And to do that, you need to really understand the anatomy, the, the, the kind of the shape of the proximal ulna and what attaches to it. Um, so, you know, you've got to appreciate where the collateral ligaments attach, the fact that the ulna or the proximal ulna, sorry, the electron the proximal ulna takes the whole of the tricep, um, and then also the, the articular surface. Um, so again, the Mayo guys, they came up with a simple classification system. One, two, three. Uh, see, Elvis is really easy. One is undisplaced, two is displaced and stable, um, and three is displaced and unstable. So the majority that we're going to see is the twos, right? So that's your electron fractures. And you can split them up into non-comminuted and comminuted. How do you fix them? Um, so there are various different ways of doing it. So first one is, particularly for underspaced fractures, you can leave them alone. Traditionally, they've been fixed with KYs and tension band systems. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more plates being used to fix fractures. Before kind of plates got particularly good, um, this horrible operation was done, was, which was basically excising a very comminuted electron fragment and advancing the triceps into the ulna. Um, not really done very much. Um, the only other thing to do is just excise the whole thing, which I would not want to do on any of my patients. So what would we use for the different types? So for a simple undisplaced fracture, the best thing to do is nothing at all. You can immobilize a patient for a week or so, but I wouldn't really go, you know, for me, it's a week max. Um, 10 days is pushing it, and then you get them moving. Then follow up the patient closely, and if you think that the fracture is either not going to unite or displace, you can then offer them fixation. Um, these normally happen when patients just fall directly onto their elbow, uh, and because you don't have that kind of tricep pulling on it, causing the injury, um, they don't really displace. So may type two, I displaced. Uh, you can do three things. You can do nothing at all. Uh, you can always do nothing. It's the easiest option. Uh, you can tension band it, or you can plate it. Now, one paper that is worth you remembering is this. Sorry, all my things not come over very well. But Duckworth, um, who's up in Edinburgh, he did a really important study, which was stopped early because of the results were so promising, which looked at um, uh, a randomization of operative or non-operative management in electron fractures in elderly people. And um, because there was such a huge number of complications in the operative group, the, the study was stopped early. Um, and effectively what this told us and what this gave us license to do is anyone who comes in over 75 or 80 physiologically with an electron fracture is completely fair game to leave them alone. And actually functionally, they do really well. The ones to watch out for, the ones who need their elbows to mobilize. So those who can't really stand up, or immobilize with Zimmer frames and so on, be wary of those ones, but otherwise you can leave these alone. If you are going to fix them, what most people would use nowadays, well not nowadays, always is a tension band construct. So for this, what we do, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, is turn tensile forces into compressive forces. So in the elbow, the center of rotation is right here, 
and you have the triceps pulling in one way and the forearm going in the other. And that causes tensile forces, i.e. the fracture fragments are moving apart. And that doesn't produce a nice environment for bone healing. What you want for bone healing is a fracture to squeeze together so those little osteons can jump across. So what a tension band does um, is the K wires in theory are supposed to protect it. And then the tension band applied on the compressive side basically means that the tensile forces, which were here, turn into tensile forces. Um, sorry, other way around. The, the tensile forces, which were here, turn into compressive forces. And the tensile force is moved to the other side by shifting the central rotation. Um, so that's a, like kind of exam fodder or interview fodder when you're when you're going for your SP3 interviews and even for your FRCS. So that principle of attention band is really important for, for you all to know. Um, in practice, I think it's rubbish. I don't think it works. I think all you're doing is K-wiring uh, a fracture back together and then using a, uh, another bit of wire on the outside to secure it. In theory, for it to work, you, you need people to be actively extending their triceps. So the norm is just to hold your hand there and allow gravity to take your, your forearm down. Um, and I can't remember the last person I saw being told to actually actively extend their elbow, which they should be. So I'm skeptical about whether or not this actually works. But anyhow, um, so what about flex plates? As I said, becoming increasingly popular. Um, it's a big issue with plates. People find um, them irritating and a third of them have to be taken out. However, a third of tension band constructs are taken out anyway, um, but they, they are irritating. Um, the other issue is that the proximal bit of the ulna doesn't have much bone, so it's difficult for um, to get a good hold of it. Um, what people often don't appreciate is that the the proximal ulna is not a straight bone, and it's uh, both you know in all in all the views you look at it. So the the first angle that you can see here is the proximal ulna dorsal angulation. That's normally about 10, 11 degrees. So if you've got a short plate that kind of sits around up to here, it's not a problem. But when you're using longer plates that extend all the way down, you've got to give the plate a little bit of a bend so it can come around that corner. Otherwise, what happens is the plate is stronger than you know, your temporary fracture reduction, and you end up reducing the plate, sorry, the bone to the plate, and you get you know, a, a poor fixation. Uh, similarly, um, there's a varus angulation to the proximal ang uh, to the proximal ulna. Uh, most plates tend to tend to kind of compensate for that, and you have a left and a right. Um, and then finally, the electron diaphyseal angle as well shows the, the position of the of the kind of the joint surface to the proximal ulna. So, um, you know, again, probably a little bit advanced, but just bear it in mind if you're using a long ass plate on the proximal ulna. Um, I'm going to skip past this, but uh, if you just ignore the writing and just look at the pictures, it just highlights the point, right? Straight plates with a, you know, quite a big fooder and similarly with a various angulation. So you, you can't use a normal plate. Um, these are just some examples of plates. And you can actually see that this is taken from the Synthes website. And what they kind of done is try to incorporate that fooder into the plate with a straight plate. So it's deceiving. Um, so just be aware of it. And this extra right here is just to highlight the fact that you haven't got much proximal bone and it's easy for the screws to back out. And what I tend to do is not only fix it, but do a kind of a suture fixation um, through it as well. Um, the next few slides are a series of fractures of the proximal ulna um, that I'll just run through again. These were, were leads up in Cambridge. Um, so you can see from this, you've got uh, kind of a bad Montedra type fracture where you've got dislocation of the radial head and proximal ulna fracturing. Um, so this is going to be like a, a three-ish, right? Treatment-wise, again, there's lots of you on the call, so I'm not going to start asking people, but for me, this is a super bad injury, so you've got to fix it with plates and screws. So you can't use a tension band because it needs more stability than that. Um, I have never, thankfully, ever fixed, fixed an elbow and hope never to have to do so. You fix them, you get them moving straight away. Um, Similarly, bad injury. Um, so I think similar classification and treatment. So this was fixed with a plane and screws. And you can see, unfortunately, this patient had a large chunk of their joint surface missing um, and some screws fixing back one of the uh, areas of the ligament where it's going from to the medial side. Now, what was missing in this patient is the anterior medial facet 
Now, again, another patient, similarly bad injury. Um, they were fixed. It still all fell apart. Perhaps the fixation, the, the plate wasn't taken far, far down enough to the ulna. Um, and so, again, not enough hold in it. Uh, that bit of bone wasn't captured. Um, but luckily, the patient did all right. Uh, just, again, whistling through these. I'm just going to skip through them so we can move on to some stuff that's a little bit more relevant. Oh, this one's a nice one, actually. Um, bad fracture that someone decided it would be a good idea to to, to tension band, not liking these long screws. So I think it's the wrong operation and long wires. And then looking through what happened two weeks later, obviously it's all going to fall apart. So where do you go from there? Take everything out and patient's got a stuffed elbow. And it's another example of poor K wiring. Patients are really bad. Worst case scenario, they end up with an elbow replacement. So I know that was um, rushed through those, but I, I, what I'd rather do is spend a bit more time kind of tackling some other topics as well. Um, so the coronoid, we're beginning to get more and more interested in the coronoid. Um, traditionally, we used to use the Morris classification, which looked at, so for those of you who don't know, this is a little bit of a proximal ulna, which is called the coronoid. And what we used to do is think about it in on the lateral plane in terms of how much of it is broken off. So just the tip, you know, 50% of it or all of it. Now, this is a really bad classification system, and I'll show you why, right? So um, in this x-ray, you see this little fracture here, and you go, oh, that's probably a one or a two. But the same patient having had a CT, you can see that it's not just the tip. What you're looking at is this part of the fracture, and actually the whole anterior medial facet of the coronoid is broken off. And this is a bad injury. And if you rely on that lateral, you're never going to appreciate the significance of it. Um, this patient came back three weeks later, and actually that fracture fragment moved apart and all of a sudden you can really appreciate how bad an injury it is. So O'Driscoll, um, who again one of the big guys in the States, came up with a separate classification system where he talked about the tip, the little bit that we just appreciated, the anterior middle facet, which is the bit that broke off, um, or the base, looking at all of it. And that's I think kind of what we moved into the like noughties and and 2010 onwards. Um, but one thing, one classification system, which is more recent, which I really like, is Adam Watts' uh, who's up in Manchester. Um, I think Muzzy's going up to do a fellowship with. Um, but essentially, he splits up the, um, the coronoid or the, the elbow into three columns. Lateral, the radial head, the middle, um, so the, the kind of the tip or the lateral aspect of the coronoid, and the medial column, which is the anterior, uh, anterior medial coronoid facet. Now, the reason why I like this classification system is he then went on to describe these different types of injury patterns based on those um, those columns. Um, so the lateral one, I the radial head, the medial one, the anterior lateral facet, and the medial, the anterior medial facet. And so you've got these different types of injuries. Anterior medial fractures, your whole coronoid are your basal fractures with or without the radius. The combined or comminuted ones are you get the kind of tip and the radial head. I'm sure you'll recognize that as a terrible triad. Or your kind of diaphyseal fractures that sometimes involve the coronoid. Who's drawing little dots? I don't know what happened that. It's not me. But anyway, um, so if we just take this one to start with, the anterior medial facet, when you see those fracture patterns, what's happened is the elbow has gone into a um, into a very stressed and rotated posterior medially. Um, that often happens when people fall backwards. Basal ones tend to happen when you have more of an axial load, and that leads to a kind of Montegia type fracture when you get dislocation of the of the radial head. Type C's is your PLRIs, are your terrible triads. So you've got lateral clatural ulnar ligament, sorry, lateral ulnar clatural ligament injury, radial head fracture, and coronoid fracture. That's similar to the PLRI, but you rotate laterally um, and posteriorly instead. And finally, with your coronoid being intact, your diaphyseal or 
um, uh, of your status of fascism. Now, the next thing the paper goes on to do, which is awesome, is it tells you what's broken and what you need to fix. So when you see someone who's got an anteromedial facet fracture, i.e. type A, you know that their lateral ulnar clash ligament would have torn for them to allow to pivot out to fracture that anteromedial facet. So when you're taking these to theatre, you need to fix that lateral ulnar clash ligament, fix the coronoid, and then maybe fix the medial clash ligament. So I'm not going to go into all of this, but what I wanted, the reason why this is here is just to say that when you are seeing these patients in A&E and you're trying to classify them, have a read of this paper that Adam Watts wrote because it's really going to help you understand them and understand what structures are torn or injured and what they need to be fixed. And you'll look like an absolute hero in your trauma meeting. Um, this is uh, a CT of an anterior medial facet fracture. Uh, and what I want to show you in this is on the, on the CT here, it doesn't look too bad, right? You can kind of see like a little bit of a rim. And I remember when I first looked, I was like, oh, that can't be too bad. But obviously having read Adam's paper, I thought, no, let's take the theater. And you can see this big drop sign. So you know this is an unstable elbow. And when I stress it, you can see it was opened up. So the first thing I did was fix that lateral anticholastral ligament. Then I put a plate on the elbow, like so. And then uh, I fixed the medial collateral ligament. Now, it is a misconception that the medial collateral ligament originates from the epicondyle. It actually is from, uh, from where kind of basically the common flex origin originates. It's actually the anterior inferior medial epicondyle. So it's that point there. The patient came back two weeks later and was pretty much full range of movement. Well, I'm probably lying because on the other side, she was hyperextending a little bit. So she's probably about 20 degrees short. Um, what you'll see the most of is terrible triads. So as I've said, these are, well, this is C2, you can't see, but the lateral ulnar collateral ligament in, injured, a radial head fracture, and then a coronoid tip fracture. So what normally happens is as you're as you're posterior laterally rotating, the radial head here engages on the capitellum and shears off, and that's why you get your radial head fracture. And in doing so, your lateral ulnar collateral ligament then tools it tears off, almost always the humerus, and then it carries on coming around, and then you get avulsions of the coronoid. So you don't get proper big, you know, chunks of the coronoid breaking off. And um, some books say that 80% of the injuries to the lateral and collateral ligament are from the humeral side, and um, and the rest come off the uh, ulnar side. But I don't think that's true. Um, you can have patterns of terrible trials or PLRI type injuries where the lateral and collateral ligament stays intact, but you basically get the whole posterior capsule, what's now called an osmotic cotral lesion, shearing off, and so the radial head jumps out but leaves the luckle intact. Um, so I think probably what happens sometimes is people go into an elbow and say, oh, look, the, the, the humeral attachment's okay. It must have come off the ulna. But actually, it's not. It was never. The whole luckle is okay. And it's actually just come off the back. Um, so, yeah, uh, bear that one in mind. So how do you deal with these? You open up the elbows. You fix the lateral and collateral ligament. That's what that little bony anchor is demonstrating. You fix the radial head. With the coronoid, if it's a significant enough tip, you can grab it and bring it through some drill holes. Those are drill holes from my approach. I use something a bit random, um, but you can pull it through the ulna. So you basically, as you're fixing the radio head, you grab some capsule drill holes here, get those sutures back through here and tie them off. Um, and this is just an example of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament has an isometric point to right smack bang in the middle of that lateral epicondyle. So you need to see that perfect circle and put your drill hole right in the middle of it before placing your anchor. Uh, I don't know how many of you use LinkedIn regularly, but I saw this post of somebody who was really proud of himself. Um, but I was chuckling a little bit because it described his medial collateral ligament reconstruction, and then I saw where his anchor was put. And we know that that's not where the MCL originates from, down here. So this was in the wrong place. Um, so that just made me chuckle a bit, which is why I thought I'd put it up. Um, so terrible triads are common, we see loads of them, but do you have to fix them, right? So if you see them in A&E, do you say to them, you absolutely have to have an operation? Um, and you don't. So back to David Ring again. So he, he published a series um, in the Journal of Hand Surgery, 
four patients treated or not treated well, one did stiff, one was quite stiff. Um, so what can we get from this then? Selected cases where you've got relatively small fractures, particularly the radial head, that aren't really displaced without a mechanical block, and it's all well in line, you might get away with treating them non-op. So the first terrible triad I saw as a consultant was this young lady, and you can see the coronoid, little chunk of the coronoid coming off here. CT scan, you can see tiny radial head fracture here, where it basically sheared off. And I brought her back a week later. She was totally congruent. You can barely tell there was an injury. Six weeks later, absolutely fine. So she got away with it and she came back three months and a completely normal range of movement. Um, so I think we've kind of, I've kind of really raced through loads of different pathologies, um, the majority of which you're going to be seeing. The next thing I want to spend a little bit of time doing is just explaining to you how to properly examine an elbow to assess whether or not it's stable, uh, particularly in an acute setting. Um, so the first thing that you have to do is figure out whether a stelbo, uh, an elbow is stable to within 30 degrees of extension. If it is, you can get away with rehabbing the patient generally without an operation, obviously depending on the pathology. But if you can't get the patient to that 30 degrees without them dislocating or without them being really apprehensive, then it's probably an unstable elbow and you need to think about doing something. Um, you need to assess for varus and vagus stability. And to do that, you need to flex the elbow to 30 degrees because it unlocks the electron. If you're in full extension, you're unable to, uh, so the electron basically locks in its fossa and that provides a bit more stability. So you're not really able to assess the ligament. Um, so varus LTL, valgus MCL. To get the valgus, what you need to do is you need to pronate the forearm so you lock the radial head in as well, and then apply the valgus force. Um, uh, oh, yeah, repeated that. Because it's so important, are they stable to within 30 degrees of extension? Um, now, if you want to assess for rotational instability, i.e. PLRI really, um, you patient flat on the back, like in the picture, and then the arm backwards. You start with the elbow in full extension, and then you keep them fully supinated, you apply axial and valgus load, and then you flex them up. And if they look like they might pop out or they feel apprehensive, unstable. Um, so uh, this is an example of how you would do it in theatre. So you have the patient fly on the back, you get the feet arm coming in like so, and you've got to have them parallel with the bed. So um, the first thing you've obviously got to do is make sure that they're reduced on the AP and you can get that elbow out fully straight. Flex them up 30 degrees, as we said, unlock the electronom. You apply the varus stress, which assesses the integrity of the lateral ulnoclateral ligament, and you get a photo. And then you apply the valgus stress. And what's wrong? As I mentioned, the mistake here is the forearm is supinated. Pronate it, locks that radial head into place, and you can properly assess the MCL. And I know from my x-rays that that is me assessing the MCL because the, the, the radius is crossing over the ulna because it's pronated. Um, the next thing is about looking from a lateral point of view and are they stable in extension? Um, one of the mistakes people make is they try and move the arm to match the C-arm, the, i.e. the image intensifier, and then you just basically applying solutional forces. So you get, get the radiographer to earn their money for the day. Um, start flex and ensure you're congruent and then bring them out slowly and then assess whether or not you can get to that magic number of 30 degrees and whether or not you can get straight um, then if you really want to push the bucket you hold the humerus and you allow the elbows to flap down uh, and if they're not popping out the elbow's not going anywhere um, sometimes you get elbows which um, you're, you're not stable right so you, you can't get them to the 30 degrees because the elbow is desiccate, dislocating and this is the algorithm I use um, when fixing them so the first thing you need to do is fix bone problems to so fix the radial head, fix the coronoid. The second thing is you fix the lateral and lateral ligament, mainly because it's the easiest thing to fix. And if you've got patients with both luckal and MCL injuries, you can sometimes fix the luckal and then you can get them to within 30 degrees of extension and you can leave them alone. Problem with fixing the medial collateral ligament is twofold. Firstly, you've got to move the ulnar nerve out of the way. And well, the ulnar nerve and, and me aren't particularly good friends, so I avoid it as much as we can. And the second thing is you don't have that isometric point, so you stiffen patients up. If you're still not able to get the patient stable, think about circumferential capsular fixation. And what I mean by that 
is sometimes you get real bad stripping at the front where the capsule comes off the, all the, the whole proximal ulna and the coronoid. And you get similar things at the back. So do you remember when I was saying about terrible triads? You can get the capsule ripping off the back, um, the Osborne cotral lesion. Um, so think about fixing that. And if you still can't get the patient stable, then the bailout option. So the sickle sling is a cool operation where you're basically taking a slither of the triceps and putting it through a hole in the humerus and then into the ulna. And that forms a sling around the elbow. Um, you can expect it. You can just put a big old K wire through the armacumal joint, or you can use new fancy things like the um, internal joint stabilizer, which leader are um, are uh, are the reps for, uh, and that's quite a, quite a cool thing. Um, there's one thing saying all this, and there's another thing actually figuring it out on the table. Um, and there's this concept of dynamic congruence versus static incongruence. Um, and when you're sitting on the fence and you can't figure out when you need to go from you know, you fix the luckle and all, well, I'm not sure, is it still unstable? I can't decide whether to fix the MCL as well. It's really useful to bear this concept in mind on those kind of on the fence cases. Essentially what it means is when your patient's asleep and you haven't got all those muscles, you know, your biceps, your brachial is firing and, and sucking up the elbow joint, um, you have static incongruence, i.e. you don't have that kind of dynamic work. Whereas dynamic congruence means when the patient wakes up, and they start firing up those muscles, it absorbs a lot of the stability of the elbow joint. So as I said, when you do have those on the fence moments, sometimes you've got to put a little bit of faith in this concept and just wake the patient up and get them going. Um, so this is uh, one of the first, again, one of the first patients I did. Um, so just, I'm gonna run through this, you know, bad elbow dislocation. Um, one thing that I'm, trying to get some data on but it's really difficult is, is when you look at the coronoid on Teresa uh, on the CT scan it's all the way up here so for me if I see that I know that this is a really bad injury because for the coronoid to have escaped all the way up there all this soft tissue here must be stripped off sometimes in terrible triads or whatever fracture patterns or elbow injury the coronoid will be broken but about here and in those again you know the capture is not too bad but if you see it flung up that highly it's bad um, patient was reduced, but she popped out. So this was taken just before we started in theatre. So first thing I did, fixed lateral and collateral ligament. She had a tiny radial head fracture, so I didn't bother. Uh, this was a terrible triad in theory, by the way. Um, but she was still unstable, and you can see on this X-ray that you know I've pronated the form of her MCL is still opening up, therefore she's unstable. So what do I do? Uh, sorry, lateral, just demonstrating the fact that it's a drop sign, it's an incongruent joint. So that is the anterior inferior portion of the medial epicondyle. So I put another anchor in there and fix the MCL. But she's still unstable. So I have to go around the front, and I noticed that all this capsule had stripped off. So I fixed it at the back, and then I fixed, sorry, fixed it at the front and fixed the capsule at the back, and lo and behold, she's then stable. Um, I've mentioned this drop sign a few times, but essentially, when you're looking at a lateral of a patient and you can see a gap in the armacumal joint um, and it's persistent after a reduction, like so, it is a really subtle sign, but a really useful one of instability in the elbow. And honestly, you see these guys, girls coming in with what looks like a reduced elbow, but a subtle drop sign. And two years later, their elbows are completely trashed because they're just rattling around. Um, so be wary of that. Keep an eye out for it. I'm going to quickly talk about Montegas because I've spoken about them um, and it's something that we do see relatively commonly. So it's worth knowing a bit about. So a Montegia is a fracture of the proximal ulna and a dislocation of the radial head. Loads of classification systems, but this is the most commonly used. Bado's from the 60s. So there's four types. One, when the radius pops out anteriorly. Two, posteriorly. Three is apparently anterior lateral and you get a metaphyseal ulna fracture. And four is when you also have a radial, uh, a radial fracture as well. Now, I don't really like this, mainly because I can't distinguish between one and three. Um, so I don't find this particularly useful classification system. Um, two of the bad ones, so the posterior ones are the ones which do particularly badly. Um, and th there are subclassifications, but you know, I'm just gonna skip this because I think it's probably a little bit too much information. Um, I think kind of the take home is going back a couple of slides, exactly what the fracture is, bearing in mind the 
um, what the different types are and knowing that difference in that and that, this is a bad one, this is the one that the patient's going to do really bad from, badly from. Um, when fixing these, it's a pretty, you know, you can look like a hero when you do these because um, all you have to do is fix the ulna. And if you fix the ulna, um, everything falls back into place. If you remember back to Adam Watts' classification, if you, you, with the Montegias, I think they were the, the Bs, we know from that paper that your LCL is commonly gone. So if you see a posterior one and you're in theatre, you ask your radio fellow consultant, have you assessed the LCL? Um, if, where are we? Oops, sorry, going back. Um, if you fix the ulna and you try and pop the radio head back in and it's not going in, almost certainly it's because you haven't reduced the ulna properly. If you get it anatomic, it'll go back in. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about these very quickly, are distal humeral fractures. Um, there are two types, intra-articular, extra-articular. Intra-articular, you can either brace them, treat them or not, or you can fix them. There's been lots of papers, including this big one, looking at the two different types. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and essentially, there are more or less equivocal outcomes between the two. With functional bracing, you get pretty much 100% union, um, but they're just, they're really irritating to use. They often cover the, you know, they often stop people extending their elbows properly. Um, so they're not particularly useful to use, whereas you treat them straight away with surgery and you get immediate stability um, and you get a much more predictable alignment. Um, so those are two things to think about. No right or wrong answer. Again, you have to take into account patient uh, wishes and expectations. Um, distal humerus fractures, which are intra-articular, there's a whole host of classification systems. I'm not going to bore you with them. Um, AO, Jupiter, there's, you know, descriptive in terms of whether they're H, there's J's, there's T's, and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so just, if you're interested, have a little look on the AO website. They're really good ways of, really good images to try and classify. Um, treatment options, do nothing, uh, what we call a bag of bones. Um, fix them or replace them. Um, I think traditionally, when they've been really smashed up, people have treated them as a bag of bones um, because they don't think they can fix them. But one thing which we're using more and more of is distal humeral replacement, so a hemi. Um, and for those patients which you probably want to do something, but it's too smashed up, it's a really good option. Um, O'Driscoll, please don't sit here trying to read that, but when distal humerus is fixed, O'Driscoll came up with a bunch of principles which talk about the use of plates, the way screws are interdigitated, um, the ability to get compression of the metaphysis. And this literally is the, the way to fix the distal humerus. So when you're getting to the point in your training when you're fixing them, it is so worth having a little flick through that and really trying to understand how you can, how you can do that. Um, and so this is one of my better operations where I kind of ticked all those boxes. And, you know, this is as strong a fixation as you're going to get. And, you know, you patients can ride a horse on this they do really well um, these again skipping through this ring again you can see with elbows it's a small world the same name come up over and over again um, you get this kind of pattern of articular fractures where you can split it up into different sections um, and when you get this really bad articular fractures like this one as i said you can do a distal humeral replacement um, there are studies that have looked at um, fixations versus elbow replacements and they've kind of said that they're both good options but the funny thing is if you look at how they were fixed in these studies they're basically using just plates that they kind of bend around so the really old crappy plate system so i think that with the newer generation fixation techniques people probably do better from fixation but anyway um this is an interesting x-ray which i just want to show you it looks like the capitellum is broken but when you look at the CT scan in this patient, actually, it's not just the capitulum, which is this portion. The whole back wall of the lateral distal humerus is gone. Um, so people often see that and try and put some screws in it, and they don't realize the whole distal humerus is smashed up. Again, probably a little bit A-level, but uh, it's probably flies. Right. We have some... Oops, I've just given away the first question. We have some questions, um, but I appreciate the fact that I've raced through that as quickly as I can, and it's 9 o'clock already. So I don't know whether you guys want to spend a few minutes. Oh, they've gone up anyway. Um, I don't know whether you guys want to spend a few minutes going through some questions or whether you want to find some 
some questions at me. Uh, whatever you guys prefer, I'm happy with. There are a few questions, but I think we can still do the poll questions quickly. You want to do the polls? Okay, fine. Uh, can, can you guys see the polls? I've ended my presentation. Yes, yes, they can. Great. Okay, so, uh, oh, well, you know the answer to that one. Um, I will. So, I'm going to back. Fine, good. I'm glad you were listening to that. So, the, uh, so there's 10% who got that wrong. Why won't you listen to the presentation? Um, so, question two. Oh. Well, I hope at median uh, all the major plumbing is at the front of the elbow. That's why we always go in the back, or mainly go in the back for most things. Um, the iron nerve is one that's the tricky one that you you can um, you can. Roger, median nerves relatively protected. The only time, actually, you know what? I take that back. I'm being, I'm being a bit mean. And um, if you're fixing the, the, the humeral component of the MCL, then it's, it's the ulnar nerve that gets in the way. If you're going to fix the, the, the ulnar attachment of it, there's different ways of coming in the elbow, and you basically go from like a, a, a Taylor sham, which is coming right in the back of the electron, and peeling to a Hodgkiss, which is like a, an over the top approach. And if you really go too far over the top, yes, you can injure the median nerve. So for those three people, well done, because I'm sure that's what you meant. Uh, right, next question. Oh, uh, what's going on? I will put it oh, up. Are you doing it? Oh, sorry, I'm just fucking away. Uh, I'm doing well, I'm controlling it. Second, there we go. Okay, what is the best treatment option for a Mayo 3 radial head fracture with a coronary fracture in a 70 year old? otherwise a really bad one that you can't really piece back together. Oh, I like this. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm assuming I have to end poll for you guys to see the results. Yes. End poll there. And I hit share results. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's the, it should be an afterplot. So what I'm getting at with this is it's a bad fracture of Mayo 3. So we said Mayo 3s are unreconstructable. So just a technicality, I caught you out on that one for those who said Oris. Um, so I've said coronoid fracture as well, because, again, that is your giveaway that this is a really unstable, bad injury. So you're never going to excise those. Um, Non-op collar and cuff, yeah, you could. But if you've got, again, a smashed up radial head and a coronoid fracture, this is a bad injury. So if you say non-op collar and cuff, you're basically telling them they're going to have a shitty elbow for the rest of their lives. Yeah, so for me, it would be an off -plus. I know these are kind of not the easiest, slightly broad questions, but those are the themes I wanted to highlight. And I'm glad no one said plaster. Never plaster an elbow, ever. Uh, do you want to put the next one up? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Flick through those. My results coming in slowly. I'm going to probably just end it in. Oh, okay, it's already been ended for me. Sorry. All right. No, it's all right. Okay, so uh, absolute indications for treating open fracture. Yeah, any open fracture you've always got to treat properly. You know, again, at the London, you see it loads. Patients coming in from, um, you know, St. Elsewhere with a really poorly managed open fracture, you've got to get those bones delivered, you've got to wash them, you've got to clean them, and you've got to fix them, reduce the risk of infection. Um, uh, and bearing in mind, I, you know, I try and put these up, um, you know, what, what's that saying? Only cysts deal in absolutes. So, no, you're not, it's not absolute indication, but essentially what you're saying is there's got to be a good bloody reason not to treat an open fracture. Um, 
So this one's a bit of an ambiguous. I, I appreciate this is probably a crappy question, but one of the reasons to do so is if you've got a neurological injury. So it's not uncommon to have um, clavicle fractures associated with plexus lesions. So in those cases, you've got to think about fixing them and exploring the plexus um, if necessary, but you know, just a little bit reduced finger, maybe not. Um, uh, a floating shoulder, yeah, so this is a, a tricky one. So a true floating shoulder in theory has high rates of non-union and the books will always tell you fix them. Um, in reality, I, I'm not sure that always happens. Um, I think people, uh, it's not one of those situations where if you've got a floating shoulder, you're definitely going to go into a, a non-union. It's again, upper limits all about the patient and what they do, what their expectations are. Um, displacement of two centimeters shortening, no, that's definitely not an absolute indication. We showed in those papers early on that um, even displaced and shortened fractures do very well from leaving them alone. Um, and yeah, for a professional tennis player, you, you want to get them back to their sport as quickly as possible. Uh, cool. Question five? Yeah, go on, let's do one more and then I'll take any questions because I appreciate it's getting really late. Yeah, I'm just going to end it there. Yeah, three quarters of you are saying lateral. Yeah, it is lateral, uh, much higher non-union rates than medial. Or medial. Um, I reckon, again, medial people don't quite appreciate the severity of them and, uh, and diagnose them, but hey-ho. Hey. Um, so why don't we take any questions before we wrap this up? Are there any... Uh, is there anybody who has a, a burning question that they'd like to ask? So there's three questions, in fact. So the first one being um, how to assess clinically that the cor coracoclavicular ligament is still attached to the medial segment? You can't really, to be perfectly honest with you. Patients are in, in pain uh, um, and you can't. You're basically relying on the x-ray. So you're, you're, you've got to have the radiographic parameters in your mind and think about where... Um, where the coracoclavicular ligament is attached to and look for those kind of flakes of bone that are still sitting there. Um, so you can't really assess for it clinically, I'm afraid. Or maybe there is, maybe someone somewhere has described a method of doing it, but I don't know, I'm afraid. And someone else has also asked, increased risk of secondary operation with radial head RF versus replacement. Is that because of reduced operative options slash increased hesitancy to progress from a radial head replacement? Uh, no, I think so they have they can fall apart um, and they can go on to non-union, particularly the radial the the the, the plates. Um, they can become quite irritating and scarred up and reduce range of movement. So I think people then have to take them off. Um, I, I think it's just you know you try and preserve it, but obviously sometimes it doesn't work, and then you're going to have to go for an arthroplasty. Um, so I'm not saying don't put don't try and fix them because they have a high risk of secondary intervention. It's if you've got little old Doris who's fallen over and broken her elbow and you're kind of on the fence, replace it because there's a good chance that if you fix it, well, sorry, there's a better chance that if you fix it, you're going to have to go back in and take that metal work out and replace it or just chuck it all in the bin. Um, whereas if I were to break mine, I'd hope you guys would try and fix it for me rather than replace it. Does that answer the question? If not, put something in the comments. And the last question that we have is, is there any role for external fixation in the treatment of elbow fractures at all? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I say no tongue in cheek. I think in, in the polytraumatized patients where you don't want to start being putting on loads of metal and um, uh, you, know, you don't want to start fixing all their soft tissues yet, if you want to stick an X-Fix on temporarily to treat it, fine. Um, for me, where there shouldn't be a role for one is if you can't stabilize the elbow such that it's not dislocating. Um, if, if you don't have those things in your armory, such as the Sicot sling, or you haven't got the leader guides around with their IJS, you shouldn't be trying to do the operation because an X-Fix is just never gonna work. Um, trying to put a hinged X-Fix on is like near impossible. Um, and I've seen one case where the pins come out and the radio nerve's been wrapped around it. So um, so for me, it's only in management of soft tissues, not for because you can't stabilize it. Okay, uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Oresti. I think that